Hello everybody and welcome to this documentary film screening and discussion. My name is Lizzie van Dijk and I work for Peace Brigade International or in short PBI. Uh, PBI is an organization that supports human rights defenders and creates a safe space for them uh, to let their voices be, he be heard um, and that they themselves can safely uh, work towards a better future. Today we are going to show two short documentaries, but before I tell you more about that, I would first like to introduce you to uh, David Gomez Gomboa. Um, he's a human rights defender from Venezuela and our current uh, Shelter City guest. Thank you, Lisi. Thank you for participating in this event. Special thanks to PBI, to Justice and Peace, and to Municipality of Utrecht, and to any organization that have been supporting the Shelter City program. As you mentioned, Lise, I am David Gomez Gamboa. I am a Venezuelan citizen. I am also a human rights defender. And uh, I am a university professor at the University of Sulia State. I am also the founder director of Aula Abierta, open class NGO, uh, which main aim is to promote and defend academic freedom and other human rights attached to university environments. Uh, academic freedom is very important because uh, of its strong relationship to democracy and to development in societies. So I am the current uh, Charter City guest and thank you. Thanks to the Netherlands and all the people here that have been welcoming me and mm, have been mm, treating me in a very special and kind uh, way. Thank, oh, you. thank you, David. Um, yes, so we are gonna show two short documentaries of each around 10 minutes. The first documentary we are going to show has the title Where Chaos Brings. And uh, yeah, as you know, Venezuela is going through an economic, political and humanitarian crisis. And as a result, there have been many protests in the country to demand change. Uh, absolute peaks in protests were in 2014 and in 2017. Um, this documentary was filmed during one of these protests in 2017. The makers of the documentary, Braulio Al Hatar and Anis um, Michel, followed Daniela, a young medical student who started with her peers a paramedic group called Green Crosses um, in an effort to help those people who got injured at the protests. I want to warn you that some of the scenes in the documentary are uh, very shocking. So um, be also careful if you want to watch this or not, or maybe if there are children also watch it, watching. Um, and after the documentary, David will tell you a bit more about uh, the human rights violations that are going on in Venezuela um, and what the current situation is there, there is now. Um, then we will show you uh, the premiere of the Shelter City documentary. Um, and this documentary is one that we made with David and uh, it is about his work as a human rights defender and uh, his stay here in Utrecht. But first, uh, we're going to watch the documentary Where Chaos Reigns. Pero hablaron con él. Sí. 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 S
Mi nombre es Daniela Lianduque, yo soy una de las directoras actuales de la Cruz Verde. Es una organización conformada por médicos y estudiantes de medicina que nos dedicamos a atender en situaciones de conflicto a las personas que así lo requieran. Miren, apenas lleguen los que faltan, vamos a hacer el círculo y salimos. Entonces estén ya preparados, por favor. Manifestante, guardia, policía o transeúnte, todos los atendemos sin ningún tipo de distinción. Que si sí tuve miedo, sí, pero que eso se disminuía cuando sabía que contaba con un equipo excelente. Cuando estaban las protestas, yo sentía que estaba en otro plano. Sentía que dejaba de proteger mi vida por proteger la de los demás. A medida que avanzaron las protestas, veíamos heridas de mucha mayor gravedad. Desde el día 1 al día 100 fue un cambio significativo, sobre todo por las heridas que estábamos atendiendo. El venezolano estaba protestando porque ya era una situación que venía incrementándose. Ir a un hospital y no poder ser atendido porque no hay insumos. Que la inseguridad sea cada día peor. De que los sueldos cada día son más paupérrimos. Dejó de hacer las tres comidas diarias en su mayoría. Y eso definitivamente detonó que se saliera a la calle. reinaba todo el tiempo hasta que ya barrieron las calles los cuerpos policiales y se llevaron a las personas detenidas o que la gente ya huyera por temor a ser herido o asesinado 
Esto es prueba de lo que está arrojando la Guardia Nacional y la Policía Nacional Bolivariana a los manifestantes. Es un cartucho de perdigones, como pueden ver, con una metra adentro. No es mentira, es real. Aquí está la prueba. Yo estaba al lado de este señor, estábamos aquí protegiéndonos de las bombas lacrimógenas y cuando entraron y le dispararon una bomba lacrimógena en la cara. Delito de lesa humanidad. ¿Cómo hacen ustedes esa vaina? Cada día más personas heridas, más detenidos, más muertos. Se veía que estaba más lejos esa meta de conseguir un cambio en el país. Yo creo que las protestas se acabaron porque el venezolano se agotó. En cualquier familia que preguntes, mínimo una persona se dio al extranjero porque es una necesidad de sobrevivir. Decidí quedarme para terminar mis estudios. Quiero ser médico en este país porque realmente creo en la reconstrucción de Venezuela. Aunque sé que el camino no va a ser fácil. So welcome back. Um, we were first in doubt uh, whether or not to show this documentary because of the shopping content that's in it. But in the end, we decided that um, we should do this because we think it's important to raise awareness um, on the gravity of what's happening in Venezuela um, and not to close our eyes for this. So David, can you Tell us maybe a bit more how you experienced the protests and how these protests uh, were in your hometown in Maracaibo. Yes. Um, first, I want to say that um, there are some patterns that were repeated in different cities. So what happened in Maracaibo was the same that what happened in Valencia, in Merida, in Caracas, in any place of Venezuela, because the different violations of human rights in terms of the criminalization of protests uh, responded to different patterns. Uh, and it was um, generalized. I want to highlight uh, two main situations. First, that uh, we in Venezuela uh, face an authoritarian regime. And second, that we are living a very important humanitarian crisis humanitarian situation. And uh, uh, regarding the first point uh, that we are facing an authoritarian regime, everyone can notice that it should be and it is very difficult to um, claim and fight in favor of your human rights 
your rights uh, or to fight in favor of democracy mm -hmm. in the context of demonstrations and protests. Repression is very hard, mm -hmm. as you can uh, notice in the video. Yeah. For example, in 2017, when uh, I was with my team from Aula Abierta NGO, the open class NGO, trying to register the, the different violations of human rights on the streets in a very important protest in Maracaibo, uh, we were um, recording some policemen who were shooting against students. And as they noticed that we were recording them, they approached us and uh, they um, stole, they took the phone of the member of the team that was used to record. Of course, the objective was to erase any kind of uh, proof about the violations. They also uh, wanted to put us in, into jail, in, in prison, but I, as they noticed that we were human rights defenders and we belong to an NGO that has any um, connection and articulation with international community and in, international human rights bodies, they released us, but we never um, uh, get back the, the phone that was taken. So, in this work of um, registering the different violations of human rights and the different practices and actions on criminaliz criminalization of protests uh, in 2017 and 2019 to 2019, we um, registered some selective detention against university professors and students. At least 382 students and 19 university professors were arbitrarily detained between 2017 and 2019 during public demonstrations. Uh, some of them were brought to military courts in contravention of the minimum standards uh, on human rights. 339 students were arbitrarily detained during April to July 2017, uh, and at least 41 university students were arbitrarily detained the team during, uh, between January to May of 2019. Uh, we registered also that um, some of them were victims of torture, cruel, degrading and inhuman treatments, and the stigmatization as terrorists, conspirators, traitors against the uh, motherland the country. Just for being on the streets protesting. And Yes, and some of them uh, were also attacked uh, by the colectivos. Colectivos are a group of civilians who support the de facto government of Nicolás Maduro, uh, who provided them uh, weapons and, you know, they, they work as a paramilitar, yeah. parapolicial, parapolis group. Uh, we, in the different reports, um, summarize the different cases on disproportional use of force, the abuse of, 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 of the use of, of force by the police and military courts, and identified some attacks to university campuses, the infrastructure of universities, for example, 21 between April and July of 2017. I would like also to highlight the situation of the reprisals against university students, professors related with healthcare sciences and healthcare professionals uh, between 2017 and 2020. At least 14 university students and professors related with healthcare system has faced reprisals um, due to their protests because of the lack of supplies, medical material, etc. Uh, within Venezuelan hospitals, and recently due to the public criticism on the government policies uh, to handle the COVID-19, the pandemic situation. Mm -hmm. I would like to highlight the situation of the, for example, the Professor Freddy Pachano, the director of the medicine postgraduate studies at the University of Sule State, who was under threat by the government of Sule State because he uh, Mm, was mm, uh, expressing some concerns about the COVID situation in the Sulu state, or the case of Hania Salazar, who is 
the president of the North Association uh, in Sulia State, who uh, was victim of different threats from the different authorities of the um, Sulia State and the national government, uh, because she was defending the human rights of the nurses and the healthcare personnel inside the hospital, which is her regular role as the president of the association of mm -hmm. healthcare personnel in the hospitals. In this event, I, I would like to uh, I would like to honor uh, the memory of two um, students, medical students, Paul Moreno, who died in 2017, and Jetson Huerta, who died some days ago, who uh, belonged to the paramedic groups and green crosses in uh, Sulia State, in the University of Sulia State. So um, at the end of the documentary, they also mentioned that 30% of the doctors already had to flee the country and that 50% was thinking about leaving the country. And as I said before, this documentary was made in 2017. So I can only imagine yeah, the difficulty of that now, especially also with the Corona um, virus outbreak. Um, yeah, so how, how is the situation there now? Can people still go to the hospitals when they, when they get sick? Yes, yeah, the situation of the outflow of Venezuelans is really alarming. Actually, the, high, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees uh, identified this uh, outflow of Venezuela as the biggest in the region, in the continent of in the Americas, since the creation of the High Commissioner. Uh, we uh, have been calculating how many Venezuelans have left the country. It is impossible for us. Yeah, it's more difficult in the context of the misinformation policy that the de facto government uh, develops. But uh, we calculate that maybe between 6 million to 8 million of Venezuela have left the country. Um, and um, it is very important to say that the most qualified uh, professionals and uh, university professors and also the students have left the country. The dropout of the students in the different public universities in Venezuela is, um, represents more than the 50% mm -hmm. of the uh, population uh, in the universities. Um, unfortunately, the figures about the health care doctors, um, uh, postgraduate students in medicine uh, are more alarming. Uh, we prepared a report on this situation in Aula Vierta. I want to read uh, just some of the conclusions. The postgraduate studies of the University of Sulia in some medicine specialties as thoracic, cardiovascular, pediatric surgery uh, for the year 2017 had an enrollment of five students on average and the 50% of the graduates emigrated. But for 2019, last year, the average number of students is four for the formation postgraduate studies and the intention to migrate, to go out from the country in each one is alarming. Is the 100% of the students of the different specialties so in medicine. After getting as a, a diploma. Yeah, as a reference in uh, 2018, uh, 800 doctors, medical um, professionals, graduated from the University of Sulia State. Uh, from that amount, 600 migrated, uh, according to the information that the different members of the Sulia State um, Association of Doctors provide to us. So my point is, what's the future of a country if the professionals who are supposed to be qualified to face and to solve the problems of the society uh, are living in the country. I, last year, I was um, talking to my students in the classroom and I was trying to identify what was the main hope of everyone in the classroom. And I was really depressed. I was really touched because most of them told me my main goal is to get the diploma and 
leave yeah. the country and go out to other place, to other country. So it's really dramatic. So we have to work on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I would like to continue with the, the second documentary. And this will also be the premiere at the same time. Um, it's a documentary from um, Shelter City Utrecht. And it's about um, David and his work as a human rights defender um, and his stay here in Utrecht. Uh, David is staying within the program called uh, Shelter City. And this is initiated by Justice and Peace. Um, the program offers human rights defenders from all over the world to have some rest, to continue their work in a safe environment, uh, get trainings and the possibility to raise awareness in Europe and to expand their network here. Um, in Utrecht, PBI hosts the Shelter City guests. Um, well, I think I've talked enough. So here's the second screening and the premiere of the Shelter City documentary about David. My name is David Gomez Gamboa and I am Venezuelan. I come from Maracaibo, the Sulu state. I am a university professor at the University of Sulu State, specifically at the School of Law. And uh, I am the founder director of Aula Abierta, open class NGO. You can breathe the chaos uh, everywhere in my country. We face uh, shortages of medicine, food. Uh, the situation of the public services is really chaotic in some way. Imagine a place where you, ha you have to live facing blackouts of 10 hours to 16 hours per day. I am trying to describe a, what should be a modern city a very big city of around two million of people without public transportation, without internet service, without electricity, without water, without gas. The outflow of Venezuelans um, has been very, very uh, huge. I mean, maybe the, um, around 10 to 20 percent of the population have left the country. Imagine what happened in the context of the coronavirus situation. The hospitals are not prepared with the minimum provisions, with the minimum supplies. And so the situation right now is very, very concerning. In my country, the first thing that you face is a tension uh, regarding criticizing the government. Citizens are very afraid of speaking or about claiming in favor of their rights because in general everyone feels a, a fear because of being uh, maybe put in jail or maybe to be threatened directly by the government in the different ways that they used to do. Human rights defenders in my country are in the target of the authoritarian regime because uh, the government is not comfortable with the different denounces and concerns that we are registering in reports and that we are sending to or addressing or submitting to different international human rights bodies in international community, such as the United Nations ones or the inter-American uh, human rights bodies. A critical thinking is not welcomed and uh, mm, different uh, soci societal actors that uh, try to make visible a reality with a critical view are target. For example, university professors and also students who protest, who claims in favor of democracy uh, are targeted. Uh, and the scientific knowledge is not allowed 
if the government feels uncomfortable with, with this scientific knowledge. And so research is almost impossible. And so the classes are almost impossible. It's a dramatic situation because professors right now in Venezuela, university professors are trying to survive, are leaving the country. Universities are uh, losing their best professors. What represents for the country dark era? Because uh, when scientific knowledge is forbidden or is under attack, the society faces a darkness. Also, it is very important to understand that the general policy um, imposed by the government, the de facto government, is the misinformation. So, as citizens, we understand that the data or the figures that the government is documenting, uh, we know that um, we can be in front of a fake information or a general lack of credible information. And so uh, this misinformation uh, context is very dangerous in terms of the increasing of cases um, in, of coronavirus. I um, wonder myself, uh, what can I do to face this situation? What um, can I uh, develop as human rights defender and as university professor to try to contribute to the democracy in my country? And uh, that was maybe the seed and the beginning of Aula Abierta. Uh, since that time, we began to work together, we developed a team um, with students and with also professors, and we began to prepare reports on those situations. Aula Abierta uh, want to defend and protect the human rights that are linked to university environments. Uh, first, the academic freedom, which is um, the main one, but there are other human rights, such as freedom of expression, such as freedom of association, the right to education, quality to education, etc. We understood that the relationship between academic freedom and democracy is very strong and uh, that when academic freedom is under threats, the democracy itself and the development in a society is also under threat. And we understood that the um, professors, the researchers who produce scientific knowledge, but also the students who participate in the educational process should be under protection. And um, two years ago, we identified that those patterns that were being registered in our reports about Venezuela were repeated in Nicaragua uh, under the government of Daniel Ortega, for example, or in Cuba, but also in Bolivia with Evo Morales. And we understood that, for example, when Bolsonaro in Brazil and when López Obrador in Mexico came to the presidency, they also began to uh, threaten the different universities and to produce any kind of budget aphidsia against the universities. And so we understood that it, it was not a problem of left or right thinking. We understood that it's a problem of human rights and a problem of regarding the authoritarian regimes, but also uh, regarding the situation of the democracy itself and the development. To defend democracy in the context of uh, an authoritarian regime is a risky situation. And we understand that. And we have the conviction that this is the work that our country demands us to do. You can be hidden, you can be silent, or you can produce reports, you can 
how to organize your people in your society and the human rights NGOs and the universities and the different actors in the universities. When you face a risky situation, but you think about the contribution that you are mm, doing in favor of democracy and development in your country and also in Latin America, you, feel, you should feel proud of it and you should feel encouraged of mm, keep moving forward on it. Fortunately, I got the, the privilege to be selected. And so it has been a very important opportunity in my, in my life as a human rights defender and as a person also. During my stay in the Netherlands, I have like two different stages. <laughs> the one before the coronavirus lockdown and crisis and the one during the coronavirus uh, lockdown. The first one was a stage in which I was involved with the different NGOs of human rights in the Netherlands, also with different universities actors, the human rights centers of different universities. And after the coronavirus lockdown, uh, we should shift all the meetings and the different um, organized uh, activities uh, to the online format. And so I participated after the lockdown in online uh, lectures, uh, having me as the lecturer, like, like, like the guest lecturer. We also film, record some videos and uh, we prepare those videos for the students in Netherlands, uh, and we also participate in some uh, screening documentaries in the online format. And so uh, we shift the way of attending my role as Shelter City guest uh, during the um, coronavirus lockdown. Maybe the most important thing is to have thought about who you are and what plans do you have for the upcoming future in your country? I think Utrecht is a very beautiful city. It's like a magic place. I every day try to get my, my bike and to go around the, the city. And uh, I really love every canal, every building, especially the nature. I, I have... Um, enjoyed very, more, very much how the city uh, combines the architecture with the nature. I really think that I am a privileged person uh, because of the possibility of living in the Netherlands and in Utrecht uh, in this time. Uh, and uh, I think uh, People has, have been very kind, very welcoming, very open with me, and thank you for that. So, uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, first, I would also like to thank Liedewey Meyer of Jumping Jack Doll for making this beautiful documentary. Um, and now it is possible to ask all your questions to David. Uh, you can type your question in, in Zoom and uh, we will try to answer all of the questions. But first, um, I will start with one question. Um, I was wondering, because you are also a university professor, um, how 
students in Venezuela uh, can now still have an education. Now there is a lockdown and with all the electricity uh, blackouts in the country, how, how is it possible? Yes, first I would like to thank you because of this work, the documentary film is, I feel really privileged. Yes, about your question, Lisi, it is very important to say that in Venezuela, there is a general policy, state policy, um, in, to misvaluate the university uh, work. I, I mean, a general policy, uh, of restrictions and reprisals against academic freedom, university autonomy, and uh, which main aim maybe is to try to um, destroy the universities. If you conceive that the universities should produce scientific knowledge, should produce critical debate, this is very uncomfortable uh, for the authoritarian regimes. So some of the patterns that I mean in the, in the, in the video, uh, are uh, related to these uh, general objectives from the authoritarian regimes. So in this context, it's, it's very difficult to provide quality education in my country, in the general university. So uh, sometimes I, I, I see the students and professors as any kind of hero, heroes, because uh, it's very difficult and the universities are still giving classes and are still open. I want to um, uh, give you a, a figure about the budget uh, asphyxia in the universities. Regularly, uh, the universities ask to the um, centralized uh, offices in the ministry, the general budget uh, according to the plans. Mm -hmm. And regularly, universities have approved, have been approved with only the budget equivalent to the a one percent of the required amount, or maybe one to ten percent of the required. So university, the University of Sulu State uh, actually uh, had a budget uh, equivalent to the one less than the one percent that it needs to work. So uh, the education is almost impossible. The research is almost impossible. In this context, for example, if, if the, how is the financial aid to a research project? We were producing a report and we were surprised when we see that it was the equivalent of one dollar per year of project. With so you one dollar, do you cannot buy, I think, a one paper, you know? So it's a dramatic situation. In this general context, we have another very important challenge, the situation of the pandemic, the lockdown. And uh, the situation of the we, we ask, and it's a challenge, how can the universities provide a quality education if the universities uh, don't have the minimum platforms in, in technological issues? Mm -hmm. If in Venezuela we face a very important and, and very long blackouts um, in electricity uh, provisions, and in other terms, water provision, there is no public transportation, there are many, many problems. And so uh, the students uh, and people in general receive a minimum wage of around three or maybe less, three dollars per month. It is enough in my country to buy maybe one chicken mm -hmm. to eat for the month with three dollars. So in this context, of course, the students don't have smartphones. Of course, the students don't have laptops or maybe computers. Of course, it's very difficult to have the internet provision in the country. So in this context, online education is a very important challenge. We have been discussing in, in my, in my uh, school, in, in the university, in the School of Law, how can we provide uh, education to our students? Because of course, the university should be open and should be overcoming those challenges. And so we were thinking about, for example, to uh, give some classes through the um, WhatsApp chats, because the, maybe all the platforms are, as Zoom or other, uh, other platforms uh, are very heavy. And remember that in Venezuela, we have the worst uh, connectivity in internet 
in Latin America, and this is one of the uh, worst connections uh, countries in the world. Mm -hmm. with, and how would that work via WhatsApp? Yeah, so in WhatsApp, we were thinking about, uh, and we have done that kind of, um, we, we call them chat forums. Uh, we, uh, as professor, produce uh, some audios and it's with the explanations, but they should be very short, maybe three minutes as much. And uh, we uh, um, share the slides and we uh, open the so queue photos. and answer in section and the students can ask and the professor can respond. And it's like a creative way of being active in the learning process, but it is a challenge, of course. Yeah. There are other platforms that universities uh, used to have some virtual classes uh, for the provision of the education in, in an online way. But regularly, uh, the uh, challenges are very, very, very high. Yeah. Very high, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Okay, let's see if there are already some questions. Um, okay, there's one question here that's this Lide Vai, and she asks how do people get uh, or pay for their food if they don't? Earn that yes. much money. It's a very important question. Uh, for that reason, is the this is one of the main reasons of the outflow of Venezuelans, as people uh, cannot live with the with the wage that they receive with the salary. Regularly, every family in Venezuela has at least one, two, or three members of the family that have left the country. In my case, I have three siblings that have left the country. And so uh, that represents many things. One is the disintegration of the family, you know, the division of the family, etc. But with the uh, people inside uh, providing the families some uh, economical support. Who migrated. Yeah, they send the people who are working outside regularly send uh, to the families some amounts and it, it can help. Mm -hmm. But remember that the outflow uh, is a very uh, interesting and very important situation in terms of understanding the impact that it can produce in the democracy and also in the political uh, environment. Uh, if 8 million of Venezuelans have left the country, it represents 8 million of voters that maybe cannot go to any election. Mm. And those 8 millions of Venezuelans, of course, uh, are some of them are uh, leaving the country because of political reasons, because of the, uh, I don't know, threats from the authoritarian regime or, or because of the humanitarian situation. But it's very important. And I have been analyzing this subject and it's the same that happened in Cuba. So uh, this kind of authoritarian regimes promotes, are used to promote the um, outflow of people because there are eight millions of Venezuelans that are not going to, or are not going to, to be users of the hospitals or the mm. educational institutions. So it's actually or, not a bad thing for the government. I think so, leave. I think so. So uh, it's a very important issue that we should have into consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other alternatives. There are people that are importing things from, especially from Colombia. I am talking about the situation before the coronavirus situation. Right now it's really a more chaotic situation. But import some products and uh, mm, uh, sell those products uh, and have a benefit with the mm, business with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are, for example, university professors that receive, I don't know, uh, between four to seven dollars uh, per month as the salary. Of course, they cannot live without that, but so they do other things to live. Mm -hmm. They used to work for companies or for businessmen, or they produce, uh, I don't know, food and sell the food uh, in their homes or whatever. Yeah. But it's very difficult. 
Yeah. It's very, very difficult. Okay, let's see if there's another question. Um, okay, I see there are also some questions on Facebook, but um, for me, it's easier to answer it now via Zoom. I also want to tell that uh, all the questions that cannot be answered, that um, we will try to answer them later also. Um, so there is uh, one question here. Um, how many years do you think it will take for Venezuela to um, compensate for the brain drain that has been mm. going on now? Mm. It's very difficult to respond to this question. Uh, I would like to think that uh, the people who are leaving the country in terms of the very good qualified professionals uh, are going to return back to the country. A, a brain drain maybe is impossible to be compensated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most qualified professionals have left the country. So uh, it's a very big gap that we have now to face the reality that we are uh, having right now. For that reason, it's very important to support the work of universities and the work of NGOs that promote uh, the um, rebuilding of democracy and the development. Um, I, 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 every time I, I, I ask for, I request for help in this situation because uh, any financial support that could be given to um, teams of researchers, to professors, to develop projects is very, very helpful because with this small amount, this professor uh, will remain mm -hmm. his or her life researching the country and working in the country, uh, training the next generations of students. And so it's really, really uh, very, very important. And do you think there's now already enough attention on academic freedom? Or what do you notice as a human rights defender working in this field? Yes, we have been working in a promoting in the promotion of human rights that is not very uh, well known, not only inside Venezuela, but uh, also abroad. And so uh, we began some years ago to try to explain what academic freedom means and what's its main importance uh, with democracy. Because uh, as I said in the documentary film, when academic freedom is under attack, the democracy itself is under attack and the development of society. Yeah. Because when uh, the scientific knowledge is not welcome in a society, uh, so solutions, so the critical debate is are not welcome. And so the society is in a kind of the era of the darkness. Yeah. So um, it is really, really important to work on that. We have been uh, registering the violations against academic freedom and autonomy of the universities in Venezuela, but also we have identified that some patterns of practices are the same in other contexts. I mean, in Nicaragua, in, in 2018, with Daniel Ortega, in the context of the criminalization of protests mm -hmm. in Nicaragua, or also in Cuba before. Uh, but also, when Bolsonaro um, took the presidency in Brazil, he, and also Lopez Obrador in Mexico, they uh, announced, announced to uh, do some restrictions against, in, in, in budgetary, uh, terms against the universities in Brazil and in Mexico. So it's not a question, it's not a subject of left or right um, when thinking. Yeah. It's a, a point of democracy and human rights. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. What other questions are there? Um, 
there's one question here uh, from Inga. Um, she thanks you for your important work and courage. Um, Thank you. She also likes to ask you uh, why there is such a specific threat against healthcare medical students. Um, yeah, and that's her first question. So let's start with that. Yes, can you repeat it, please? Uh, why there is such a specific threat against healthcare or medical students? Yes, uh, a ver. Uh, in terms of the COVID-19 situation, uh, this is a topic that is um, forbidden in my country. Mm -hmm. As the electric electricity problems uh, topic is also forbidden. Uh, when we wanted to prepare a conference on these topics, the professors who are experts on that, uh, they are very um, afraid of speaking about that. The experts are very afraid of speaking about that because the government uh, attack or threaten uh, anyone who speak about these topics. So in this context, who um, denounces, denounces who claim about healthcare um, problems in my country uh, is facing uh, potentially some threats from the government. And this is the case of Hania Salazar, the president of the um, Association of Nurses in Sulia State. Hania uh, had received different threats in a very violent way uh, because she was defending the human rights she should uh, of the nurses and the different healthcare uh, professionals in hospitals because they were not provided with the different supplies and the different um, protect, protection measures uh, against the, the COVID-19. The professor Freddy Pachano, when he, he, he is the director of the postgraduate uh, studies of medicine in University of Sulawesi State, when he denounced some concerns about the COVID in March, beginning March, some months ago, the governor of the Sulawesi State threatened him and said, no, this professor should be uh, under any kind of prosecution by the authorities of the state. The um, uh, experts, academicians from the Academy of Maths and Physics and Nature in, in Venezuela, after they produce a report alerting about the possible increase of the coronavirus uh, cases in Venezuela because they apply the scientific knowledge in statistics and, and, and maths, the, the um, second powerful man in the de facto government, Diosdado Cabello, yeah. in his program Con el Maso Dando, called to apply to the experts the operation Tuntun. Tuntun is knock on the door of the different academicians, because they cannot talk about this subject. Because the government would see it as, a, as a criticizing form. them. Yeah, yeah. Anyone who uh, criticizes the government uh, in some very sensitive subjects, as the health care system, uh, the COVID-19, or the electricity problems, or maybe more, uh, is a potential candidate to be under any kind of threats mm -hmm. or attack from the government or from the um, civilians who support the governments. And so it's very scary situation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it, there are many possible responses also. The situation of the health, uh, public health system in Venezuela uh, in the context of the humanitarian situation, in the context of the, um, the institutionalization of the state, uh, there are not medicines, there are not equipments, there are not the minimum maintenance of the equipment in the hospitals with the electrical crisis, hospitals or health care centers, of course, in the main cases are also without electricity. So imagine the situation yeah. that we are facing in terms of health. Yeah. So it affects not only the citizens, the people, the society, of course, it affects the healthcare personnel. See, um, another question I see here is um, uh, if you, as a human rights defender, um, if you also receive threats yourself um, because of the work that you are doing. Any human rights defender, uh, as the critical journalists, as the critical university professors, 
uh, or as the um, opposition poli politicians uh, assume a risky situation about criticizing the, the government. We denounce, we denounce the violation of human rights that the government uh, and that this authority of the state develops. And we have been denouncing them and we have been documenting them and we have been preparing reports on those violations. And we have been sending these reports to the national authorities mm -hmm. because they should know that uh, we are identifying the different patterns and practices, but also we have been sending these reports to the international human rights bodies from the United Nations and Inter-American Commission of Human Rights because they exist in the international community to um, try to um, guarantee any kind of scrutiny uh, in favor of human rights before the different governments. And so uh, as academicians, that I am professor of human rights, in the School of Law, uh, we can criticize with grounds on international standards on human rights what is happening in my country. And as I told you uh, before, we have identified that not only in Venezuela, there are some practices in Venezuela, maybe we have the, maybe some of the most concerning cases, but also in Cuba, the situation is really hard in Nicaragua, but also we have been producing uh, some concerns in the reports. We have reported some concerns uh, on different countries as Colombia, as Brazil, as Mexico, uh, etc. So yeah. uh, we are human rights defenders. We know that we face a risky situation, but we should identify that there are different uh, decisions to be silent or to work on uh, rebuilding the democracy and human rights in your country. So this is the option that we select. I think it's really, as I say, it's honorable. Uh, Thank you, it's challenging, yes, of course. Yes, incredible, incredible work you're doing. I think citizens should uh, identify the responsibility. And so I think I'm not doing anything out of um, I as human rights defender as citizen as, and as university professor are uh, supposed to do. I am doing what any citizen should do. And I think the government and the authoritarian regimes should uh, rectify. <laughs> it's very difficult, but because of that, the international community scrutiny and uh, supervision is very important and yeah. so it's very important that international community and people from other countries uh, are aware of the situation that is happening in my country. Yeah, okay, let's see. Um, okay, um, here's one question of Roni. Um, what do you consider the greatest achievement of Paula Abierta? Wow, <laughs> this is uh, very difficult because we have achievement every day. Uh, when you as human rights defender and as an organization can make visible the situation of the victim of the violation of human rights, it's a, it's a very important achievement. Otherwise, this situation could be invisible. So it's very, very important. And if you make those situations visible uh, before the international community and before the different actors in your country and in Latin America, for example, or here in Europe, it's, it's a very important achievement. We uh, requested last year the, to do, to participate in a hearing of uh, from the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights about academic freedom and autonomy of the universities. Not only in Venezuela, we have been participating in some audiences, hearings on Venezuela, but it was on the Americas, it was on the continent. Mm -hmm. And so it may be in terms of the international advocacy work, it's the biggest achievement that Aura Abierta has uh, accomplished because it was the first historic audience hearing from the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights 
uh, on academic freedom and autonomy of the higher education institutions. And in that audience, the Inter-American Commissioners and the Rapporteurs uh, understood the commitment that they have in terms of protecting and supervising the situation of academic freedom and the importance of universities for democracies and it's very, very, very uh, important. We also are very satisfied with the different announcement of the High Commissioners of the United Nations for Human Rights. Uh, again, some weeks ago, uh, Michelle Bachelet uh, expressed um, her concerns on the situation of the violation of autonomy of the universities in Venezuela. And it has been repeated uh, this a monitoring uh, on this uh, special human rights by the High Commissioner of Human Rights, but also by the Inter-American Commissioners of Human Rights, different actors, the rapporteurs or, and the commissioners, and from different committees and rapporteurs from the United Nations and in general from international communities. So it's very, very important for the work of defending democracy and development through the defense of yeah. universities and academic freedom. Yes. Okay, um, well, we don't have much time left, so I will um, choose one more question. And as I said before, if your question isn't answered, uh, we will still try to do that, or you can email it to us or by the social networks. Um, we will do our best. Um, so, I see here one question. Um, what's what can the people in the Netherlands do to support um, Venezuela? Yes, um, it's very important for us to raise, to raise awareness about what um, the situation uh, in Venezuela means in terms of democracy and human rights. And uh, uh, I think um, if we have the support of the citizens uh, of different countries as in Netherlands, it's a very um, good way to, ride, to raise awareness uh, about that. Um, we have different websites in our NGOs, in, in my NGO, but also in the different NGOs, where we promote different initiatives, activities, uh, just to participate in events like this one is a way of uh, supporting maybe to retweet, uh, to read the reports, to comment them, uh, maybe to help in different ways, financial support, to support different initiatives is a well a way to support. And I am very thank you for your support here in Netherlands. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you also um, for your interest. Um, as I said, we will still try to answer all of the questions because there, were, there are many more. Um, so um, it is also possible if you would like to have some more information about David's work or his NGO Aula Abierta to go to aulaabiertavenezuela.org or if you want to know more about uh, BBI, you can go to peacebrigades.nl uh, and um, yes, no worries if um, you cannot remember all these websites now. Later on, I will send an email with all these websites again and also the um, YouTube video of the Shelter City documentary. So you could watch it again if you would like to. And um, yes, this documentary then also has Dutch or Spanish subtitles. So. Yes. That's also nice. And well, that's, that's it. Thank you again for your interest and, uh, and have a good night. Thank you very much.